All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of Tequila Tuesday. Thank you all for being here. Got his little sales club. We're talking with uh, a good friend of mine and a guy that I, I just was telling you I've, I've known for almost almost 20 years now. Uh, his name's Mike Lindstrom. He's a sales trainer, professional speaker, motivational speaker, author. I could go on and on and on about all, all the things uh, that Mike has, has has accomplished. Mike lives in Scottsdale, Arizona. I know Nick Capozzi is here. Nick is out there in Scottsdale somewhere, so maybe you guys could kind of sync up one day. Love um, my first ever sales job is where I met Mike. So I, got, I go all the way back to 2004, summer of 2004. And uh, I take this startup sales job. I don't know anything about sales. I don't know anything about startups. And, uh, you know, Mike doesn't know I'm going to say this, but there wasn't all that much training. I wasn't exactly teed up to, like, be super successful. It was like, hey, here's what we do. Like, here's half day. The second half of the first day, I'm literally on the phone, like, cold calling people. It was like that kind of situation. And, uh, you know, I don't remember at what point in time Mike came into the picture, but Mike was an advisor and consultant for this company. This company is called Reply. And when Mike came into the picture, it was the first time that I had ever talked to somebody who, who understood sales in this way and understood people in this particular way and thought about, you know, peak performance and, and how to like break through, you know, limiting beliefs. He started talking about all this stuff and he gave me this book by Tony Robbins and he's telling me that he was one of Tony Robbins' first employees. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Right. And my, my mind is like blown. And he just like pumped all this life and, and energy into me and some of my buddies. Mike knows these guys like Henry Frazier, Javier Vellante, Rick Clayton, all these kind of people. And, uh, you know, we stayed in touch even beyond that, that gig of mine. And I, I, I kind of told Mike this a couple of weeks ago, but Mike has always been like my kind of unofficial mentor. Um, I never really told him that, but you know, when I started doing consulting, I'd reach out to him and say, Hey, I got this thing and, you know, thinking about charging this and Mike's over there going, Jesus Christ, Scott, you got to like triple your prices. You know, he's like pushing me to do all this kind of stuff. I opened a couple offices in Arizona through the years. Mike would come and, you know, talk to my, my sales teams down there. We'd have lunch, grab a drink. Um, just an incredible guy, and I'm really excited for all of you to get to know him a little bit and, uh, and talk to him. So without further ado, I'll let Mike take over as usual. I'm in charge of the chat here. If you've got questions for Mike, shoot me a, a private message. I'll take your name down. I'll create a queue going. I'll take you all off mute. You can interact, ask Mike his questions. I'll let Mike do his thing for a little bit. And, uh, you know, let's enjoy ourselves. Grab a drink. Take some notes. Mike is huge on notes, by the way. He once told me this story where, see, he's got his notebook. I told you, and I got mine. Mike once told me this story where he goes to the sales training with Tony Robbins, and he sits down, and this dude next to him has no, uh, no notebook, and Tony looks at the guy and says something to the effect of, uh, oh, you're not planning on learning anything today, so-and-so? He's like, boom, never going to have that happen again, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> all right, Mike. I'll, I'll get out of the way. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up here and I'll, I'll focus on the chat and everybody's uh, questions and uh, leave you to it. That's so funny. Oh man. I, oh man, team. I, I don't even know where to start. It's so, it's so surreal for me to be, um, to be in this format. I mean, you know, one thing you'll, you'll learn about me because, you know, Scott's one of my good friends and, you know, I, I wouldn't even call him mentee. He's like, he's mentored me in so many ways and taught me. More. So and Scott, I'd be proud of you. I went on clubhouse, like, Five times in the last month. Yeah, you'd be pumped. All right. I, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. So it's, you know, it's one of the best parts about the script of, of, of learning is when your uh, students become your teachers. And that's one of my favorite parts. I'm 48 years old. I got two kids, 12 and nine. They're sixth grade, fourth grade. And, you know, you, you know you're having a surreal moment, you know, last week when my son, who's 12, who's a big, he's a big kid. Candidly, he's going to hate me for saying this on a private group, but whatever. Um, I go, buddy, what, what's going on down there? He's like, dad, dad, you can't, you can't look. I'm like, oh, so, okay. You're going through puberty. I got it. I get it. I, Daddy went through puberty at 12 and 13. I totally get it. But to have those moments in life where you're like, holy crap, like this is the moment, you know, as a parent, as a coach, as you know, a friend or whatever to watch what, what, what you guys are creating is pretty cool. And, and I always want to, you know, speak to that type of stuff. And I know, Scott's a, Scott's a daddy himself. And to be able to look back on, you know, my career and my life, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm only 48. So, I mean, it's like, there's only halftime. 
so it was it was kind of cool last week um i don't know if you got do you have any chicago chicago people out there by the way chicago oh, couple there's a couple all right so uh jared payton walter payton's son is a good friend of mine he's a client and a friend of mine jared payton uh jared was in town with his wife trish and their two kids and their kids are like you know nine and seven or four nine and four and we're at cracker jack's you know putt putt golf last week on spring break and it, 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 we haven't seen each other during the whole COVID thing you know everyone's got their own reality of what's going on in their life and i and i told him i go buddy like what are you experiencing like you know the kids are you know you're going through illinois experience the state laws or what's going on there but now you're in arizona visiting your sister and hopefully you know the mom and they're going to be moving out here in sometime soon but he can't he can't leave chicago i mean can you imagine being a Peyton and leaving chicago i mean you're a cubs bears guy you're on wgn every night right you cannot leave chicago so and that's that's my counsel to him and we were chatting and he goes buddy he goes it goes back to what you and i talked about 11 years ago is my dad, his his dad, uh, 4.5 yards to carry. That's all he worried about. So he was a running back in football. You hand him the ball, he runs 4.5 yards. Guess what? Second and five. Hand him the ball, third and one. Four, you know, 4.5 yards, first down, move the chains. So that's been our metaphor uh, with Jarrett for a long time, my, my buddy. And I think about the move the chains thing a lot. When I think about all the things that we've gone through in our lives, you know, the last year, it's like, we can't think about a year. We can't think about six months or three months. You know, even my, for my personal coaching clients, I told them, hey, back in December, don't think about January, February, March, you know, as a quarter. Think of it as a month to month, you know, aspiration. Just let's just get through the months. So if you can look back and you look at your own goal plans and everything you guys have gone through, and I know it's got your goal setter. Um, I look back and everything that we've gone through for the last 13 months, and I really mean this, guys. It's like a big high five and a big knuckles to you guys. Um, it's been challenging, you know, for so many people to be able to look back on their life and what they've gone through. And it, it, I mean, looking around the audience, by the way, I'm looking around just being a little bit assessment. You know, we're pretty young. You know, my, my grandfather died at 90, you know, years and years ago. You know, if my grandfather was still alive, I would be doing everything to protect him. It wasn't about me, right? It's like you. You guys are protecting yourselves, but you're also protecting other people. So when we think about, you know, our lives and what we want to, you know, create during a crazy, you know, COVID or call it a pandemic or whatever we've, we've gone through the last 13 months, but think about your mindset and, and, and the language patterns that we have in our mindset. I always go back to, you know, you go back to, Scott, what you put in the uh, descriptor, mindset, language patterns, or NLP. And by the way, I appreciate some of your comments about, what is NLP anyway? Some of you are being totally authentic about that. Um, NLP is actually a science. We'll get to that in a minute. But I, but I just want to say thank you and grateful to be able to have this, you know, kind of a forum to be able to share very open and authentically. And I hope that you guys get, you know, one or two things that you can take away. So, Scott, you've been that in my life. And to be able to flip that script to, you know, student to mentor is, is a really important thing to me. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's so funny. I was, I was thinking on a dry race for and everything I wanted to get into. And it, it, there's a lot, man, there's a lot I want to cover, but I, I want to make, 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 make me, you can help me kind of hone the message. Like what would be the feedback that you've got leading up to this? I, I did see the comments on LinkedIn about neurolinguistic program NLP, but the biggest thing I, I want to give away is the secret sauce. Cause a lot of people don't realize that there's actually a science to this stuff. You know, go back to my mentor, Tony Robbins back in 1998, the guys who hired me and everything I created back in 99, 2000.coms when you and I met 2003, 2004. But have you got any feedback in terms of things that would be more particular? Cause I don't want someone to go all over the map. Cause it's a very, it's a very unique topic. Yeah. I, I would just start <clears throat> with what is it first of all, okay. and then how, how is it applied to selling and the sales process, both from a, <clears throat> a mindset standpoint and then tactically, Right, like what things can we say on the phone? What are we doing throughout the sales process? I would, I would kind of maybe start there. Okay, cool. So uh, if you're taking notes, I see some of you are showing me your journals. I appreciate that. Uh, if you're taking notes, write this down. So the first element of the um, the the equation, I call it, is um, is neuro. Neuro is mindset. Mindset is how you speak to yourself. And a lot of that is tied to how, how we literally speak to ourselves. Now, a lot of us don't realize that. We talk to ourselves at 1,200 words a minute. 1,200 words a minute is a lot. 
So if you don't believe it, if I if I took a hypothetical like five second timeout. You just heard yourself talk You're like, OK, what's next? Right. That's how we talk to ourselves. You think about your mindset and how you talk to ourselves. Most of us are not conditioned to wake up every single day and, and feed the brain with positivity. It's just it, that's just the way it is. We are a fight or flight. You guys know this. I mean, especially for the parents out there, raise your hand, parents out there, parents, right? You're, you're worried about your kids. Are they off to school? Can we get them out the door? What are we going to make for breakfast or lunch, right? That's all worry. So when you have worry on your mind, 1,200 words a minute, and that's the average, by the way. I figured out through a couple of buddies of mine that I average about 1,800 words a minute myself. I talk fast, as you can tell. Uh, some people are very slow in their, in their speech to themselves. Some people are very fast in their speech. But most of the patterns that we create for ourselves are, are based off of uh, number one, what our parents told us, uh, behavior, or our genetics, which is just mindset. It, you know, think about think about um, I call it nurture nature. Nurture nature is is a very difficult thing because your parents, whether they like each other or not, whether they're still married or not, my parents are divorced. They got married divorced when I was two. Got married when I was very young. Um, very rarely talk to each other, but I listen to my mom and dad talk separately and I can hear the way they speak to about each other's lives, about how it influenced my life. But I didn't know that what that was at two and a half, three and a half, four and a half. So most of our personalities and who we become to be as instincts, um, happens by the age of five and a half. So if for the parents out there, by the way, if you have anyone below the age of five and a half and you're, you're just kind of figuring it out. Now it's game time. Game time is to like influence your kids to speak in their minds completely different. Like uh, it, one of the things that Scott knows is it drives me crazy when people talk about tries and shoulds and, you know, I really, I really should do that. You know, I really, tr I should try that. I'm like try it. Try is the liars, man. Just do it. There's no should. There's a must. You got to make it happen. Right. So when you start creating a different kind of language pattern in your mindset, you start to create a different outcome. And a lot of it's that basic things about how we speak to ourselves, And that's not something we're taught. I mean, I went to college at UC San Diego down in La Jolla. I went to law school at Cal Western. And I got to tell you, of all of that investment I put in myself in education, no one, not, not one single professor <laughs> who we paid a lot of money to uh, go to school taught me influence, psychology, persuasion, goals. No one taught me that. The only person that taught me that was Tony Robbins. And Tony Robbins, by the way, if you don't know, Google him if you want, um, did not go to college, did not go to law school, did not go to med school. You know, his his argument uh, back when he was a 23-year-old, you know, six foot seven guy who was kind of goofy and out of his sorts was, I have a PhD, a PhD in results. I get a PhD in results. CEOs, athletes hire me because I have a PhD in results. And that was always really hard for me as a 25 year old young man to understand that, yeah, but you didn't go to college. You didn't go to law school. Like you're not educated, but that's not the belief that he had, you know, back in, you know, 1994, 1983. So you look at nowadays, you know, kids are struggling with, you know, should my kids go to school? Should they not go to school? Should they be virtual? Should they not be virtual? You know, what's going to be the paradigm moving forward. So you know, whether you're a parent, struggle with that or not, but the, the, the reality is the experience. Like what experience are you teaching them? But most importantly is this right here, mindset, language. So when you talk about tries, shoulds, can'ts, wants, and all the things that we do, that's mindset. You know, the other part about, um, we talk about NLP is patterns. Patterns are the things that you are. So if you look at your given day, so if I took a 24 hour period and I love, I know I kind of date myself when I say this, but if I put a tape, kind of like the matrix, right? Like I put a tape in your brain and I can record your thoughts and your focus and everything you, you do on a daily basis. And I pull the tape or the, or the CD or whatever you want to call it, right? MP3. And I, and I can look at it and I can sit there and I can go, okay, hey, Patrick, Patrick Downey, I'm going to pull your thoughts for 24 hours, seven days a week. And I'm going to look at what you think about, what you focus on. And what you give energy to every single minute, every single day. And I'm going to put it on a pie graph. And I put it up on my dry erase board. And you're going to be like, oh, my goodness. Do I know I, I thought about that a lot? Wow, yeah. But, like, that's your thought process. If 
But most people don't do that, guys. That's the problem. We don't think about our thought process and we don't think about where our thoughts and our focus go to. So when you actually able to, and now Patrick's freaking out. Patrick's, uh, hey, Patrick, I'll take you off mute here in a minute, man. You can tell me where your thoughts go, but you know I'm right, right? You don't consciously think about your thoughts and your process. But when you think about mindset, language, pattern, neuro linguistic programming, neuro is mindset, linguistic is language, self-talk programming is patterns. So when you actually think about where you actually give your patterns to, you have, you have to earn that. Like you, you, you can't give energy to things that are not welcoming in your life. And I think that's the biggest problem that we have. So I want to kind of lay that foundation because I think there's a lot of, um, and Scott, you know this, we've talked about this years ago. I think there's a lot of, and some of your comments alluded to this on LinkedIn. There's this, uh, I would say mysticism, and I hate that word. You know, there's this mysticism that is with NLP. It's like, oh, this is some kind of a cult. This is some kind of a thought process. This is some kind of a religion. The, the, the truth is it's not, guys. It's not. This is a very base in therapy and how people think. So if any of you have gone, to, you know, by the way, you don't need to raise your hand when I say this. If anyone's ever gone to therapy or counseling, okay, a lot of things that you're being coached on are around that. So when the therapist is asking you, so, uh, so Melissa Meyer, let me ask you a question. How'd that make you feel when you were 14? When that boyfriend or girlfriend didn't, you know, accept you, how'd that make you feel? They put you on the couch, right? That couch moment is you going back in time, trying to figure out what you made that mean. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we're, ne we're never taught in college or law school is, or med school or whatever, you know, you're, you're educated many levels that I'm not. What does that mean to me? Like, what does that mean to me? The choice is yours. So when you make it mean something that's going to be empowering to you, that's not something that's been gifted to us a long time ago. And that's, and, and I mean, Scott, you and I know this. It took me yeah. until I was 20 years old to be gifted that. So, you know, I had a yeah. mentor hit me right between the eyeballs and said, hey, buddy, your, your mom and dad divorced when you were two. That's, uh, that sucks. That sucks. But so what? Now you're 28. You're still holding on to it? What, what's that going to mean to you? So when you finally realize what's going to mean to you in your professional life and your career as a parent, and the challenge that we have, and we talk about in training, that we tend to we tend to take things between five and twelve years old, and that happen to us as human beings, five and twelve, and we hand it to our kids, we hand it to other people, and that and that's not fair, that because my mom said said to me at eight, and that I hold on to so big, I'm going to hand that to my nine year old son Colt. That's not fair to him. Like he didn't, he didn't live through that life. He wasn't going through a divorce. By the way, him and his mom and his dad are still, you know, the world, we're, we're all married. We're all good. But the fact that we have that kind of attachment to the meaning is so important. And I, I would say that's one of the biggest gifts that, you know, if I was going to impart anything to us as a group is not just the three elements of mindset, language patterns, but also the meaning that we give things. Cause every day when we wake up, we have a choice. Every day we wake up, we have a choice. What's the meaning we're going to give today? Right. I, I remember um, from 2004, this quote around the meaning that you talked about. And, and I never forget it. And it, it always trips me up when I stop and think about it. it says, Nothing in life means anything other than the meaning you give to it. The meaning you apply to it, I think was, was your quote, something like that. Right. <clears throat> that's what, that's what kind of what you're talking about right here a little bit, I think. Um, yeah. You know, I, you, know, a, you know, real quick, real quick, Scott, um, you know, I, I'm sure God, this, this is like so therapeutic for me, man. This is like so real. So my mom was visiting me from uh, three hours north of uh, Phoenix, where I live right now. And she came down, she, she wanted to be around the kids during COVID. And, you know, I respect that, you know, she's got her own decisions and she's older. Um, and she was getting ready to leave the other day. And I said, mom, what, what's the meaning that you've given this whole thing? It's been 14 months, right? What's the meaning that you've given this? I'm just curious. I'm not judging you. I'm just curious. Like, what is the meaning you give it? I know what, like my pop, her dad, who died at 90 years ago, I know what meaning he would have given it. He was Polish, steel worker, South Side Chicago, old school, F that, dude, we're good. Never miss a day of working his life, hardworking guy. And I know the meaning that I think he would give something like this, the pandemic. And I'm not disrespecting the pandemic. I get it. I totally get it. 
uh, it's this uh, people need to shake that. And she said, Michael, I'm, I'm really struggling with that because I have not been able to see your kids, my sons in six months. I said, mom, that's incorrect. You have the choice for six months to do that, but you chose not to. That's the meaning you gave it. I'm not saying right or left, CNN or Fox. It's not about that. This is a choice you gave it. So she's like, oh, it's so true. It's so true. So I, I've learned so much from the last year, but I want you guys to think about this from your personal life and your professional life about what's this going to mean to you moving forward. That's really taught me a lot. Just even talking to my mom, talking to my kids. I mean, my kids have taught me more about the pandemic. I mean, I, hate, I mean, I'm, I'm Catholic. I'm very open about that. We get a mass and I get to hear my nine-year-old talk about in his prayers about what he's praying for. And he talks about, Oh gosh, you know, God, I hope there's no more COVID. And I'm like, buddy, think about the things you want. Don't, don't think about the things you don't want. Think about things you want. Right. So I think that's the challenge that we have as human beings is that we're going through difficult times and we all respect each other as, as professionals and entrepreneurs, but as family members, but the things that we're all going through right now is real. And you have to remember 1200 words a minute is how we talk to ourselves. That's, that's thoughts. Feelings are real. Feelings are in your heart. You're never wrong in your feelings. For so for somebody to say you're wrong in feeling that way, that's that's inaccurate. That, that, that's how I feel. I feel I feel pissed. I feel jealous. I feel mad. I feel upset. You can't say somebody's wrong in their feelings. You can you can judge their thoughts all day all, all day long, but the reality is what's happening in the heart, especially the last year and a half of our lives, is such a real thing. And I, and I think, especially in sales guys, by the way, I think that's the biggest, I I've had, um, 10 inquiries on my sales speaking stuff that I'm doing, um, for speeches the next year, people are actually getting on live stages again. And I have a list of 12 topics that I threw out there, kind of a renewed topics. And the biggest one that is most requested is how to get back to talking like heart to heart, like have a human conversation in sales, ask questions that are tough. It, but but in an authentic way, in a loving way, not like, hey, so Scott, let me ask you a question on a zero to ten scale. Ten is we have checking app in hand. Zero is we got no chance. How are we doing? That that that's a closing question, right? When you go back to, hey, Scott, can I ask you a question? How you doing with COVID, man? Be honest with me. Shut your mouth and listen. Two ears, one mouth, right? And you just listen to what people are going through. That's what people are struggling with. And when you can just be authentic with that and just listen, and that's a hard thing. And by the way, guys, I'm not, I'm doing my best not to judge, but guys, do we suck at the F word feelings? We suck at feelings. Our dads, our grandpas, my, my grandfather in Chicago, you know, Chicago you know, right? Right. So it's, it's getting back to the F word, which is the feeling. People want to talk about that. People want to but he's off mute. Sorry, Mike. <clears throat> Vicky, you were off. You were off mute for a second on accident. Mike, I, I had a question from uh, Sanjay who had to had to run, but he wants to watch the recording. Sanjay's question was, "Okay, I understand this framework now. How do I put it into into practice?" As as he's coming from a place of like, this is all brand new. Like, what's the first one or two things I can do? you know, tomorrow to, to take action and try to apply, you know, this mindset language patterns, I control, you know, what I, the things I think about and all that kind of thing. Like any, any quick, like actionable tips that people could take, you know, starting tomorrow to apply this. So, so I, I and by the way, Scott, I can email you this stuff that you can distribute to the group after the fact. Uh, yeah, so I have, yeah, I have PowerPoints and documents on this stuff that I'll send you. Um, but one of my favorite techniques, um, and by the way, if you Google this, it's not going to be really much out there. I think, I think the last time I Googled it, it was only like in two places. One was one of my own blog posts, and the other one was like a Tony Robbins post. Um, it's a, it's a, it's what I call the eight areas of curiosity. So you have an acronym. It's B, and I'll go through it. B E N D bend, like bend or break, bend, and then wimp, wimp like. You know, like you would call a kid when he's wimpy, wimpy, W-I-M-P. So you have beliefs, evaluate, needs, desires. Okay. So when you have um, beliefs or what do they believe about you? What do they believe about the world? What do they believe about um, the industry? What do they believe about COVID? I mean, that's one of my, my biggest belief questions been during COVID is, 
hey, what are your beliefs? I mean, are, should we go grab, grab coffee or not? I mean, are you cool with that or not? That's a belief issue, right? So evaluate is how do they evaluate success or failure? How do they evaluate themselves? Uh, needs are like, what do they need? Like as a business partner, if I'm going to work with you, uh, Kendra, Kendra Warlow. So if I'm going to partner with you, Kendra, what do you need from me? You want authenticity. You want to be, to be on time. You want to be prompt. Those, those are your needs. That's really important to you, right? So I, but I can, I can surmise that, or I could ask you point blank in an email and say, Hey, what do you need from me? So now that I know the script, now I know what you need from me. That's very important in business and sales. We make assumptions. Oh my gosh, we got to get back to people the same day. And by the way, that's not my belief. My belief as a salesperson is I'll get back to you when I'm going to get back to you because I'm important. And you know what? I have a lot of people that are important like you. It's not about me. It's just that I have all these very important people like all of you. If every single one of you sent me a text today and said, hey, Mike, um, Scott told me you're very responsive. Absolutely, I am. So I have 85 people sending a text message. My goal is to get back to people. So if I'm a brand new person in my business or my life that thinks that I'm going to get back to people on the same day. I'm not going to get back to that person by the same day because it's not important to me that day. The next day it might be, but you want to be super responsive. And that's the challenge because that belief lies in the face, the face of being, you know, customer service related follow up. And I, my belief was, and I, and I guess guys, I'm not being political at all, but Tony Robbins is very good friends with uh, Bill Clinton. So when Bill Clinton was going through all this controversy way back in the day, Bill Clinton was part of our, con you know, our consulting way back, you know, when he was going through all this stuff way back. And we would look at his schedule guys as consultants to the president of the United States. And I would see this guy's schedule guys. He had, everything was incremented by five and a half minutes five and a half minutes interview, five and a half minutes to the plane, five and a half minutes. I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't imagine being on a schedule where every five and a half minutes, I got some, you know, man or woman pulling me out because that's, and he only slept four and a half hours a night, four and a half hours a night. You look at Abe Lincoln, Abe Lincoln, if you look at the book, you know, how the president sleep, he took naps back in the day. Like in 1862, Abe Lincoln took naps because he realized to be the president of the free world, you cannot sleep. People are pulling at you. And this is before a phone and TikTok and social media. Can you imagine being Abe Lincoln, just chilling back, you gonna take a nap for like four and a half hours or two hours? That's the way it works. So when you look at time and you look at yourself, that's a really important thing is like not being readily accessible. I'm not saying be disrespectful, but when you think about your, your needs and your desires and everything you wanna do with this, with this eight areas, the belief is you have to be very important to what you do. Okay, so that's B E N D needs, desires. Wounds is W. Wounds is your fears, your pains. I's interests. M mentors. P proud of. So you have beliefs, evaluate needs, desires, wounds, interests, mentors, proud of. Eight areas of curiosity. If you were to write down all the questions in a journal, pull out the journal, write it down. If you had to find out three questions of every single human being that you want to influence. I don't care if it's your kids, your wife, your spouse, your partner, whatever you have, and you identify what are the eight areas that you want to identify. That's the areas that most people don't go to. And that's why we we sold this, you know, in sales seminars back in 1999. I mean, it's kind of defunct that that, that sales seminar is no longer in effect with Tony, but that was my favorite part. We did 12 hours of sales seminar that, that year, that three year period, I'm sorry. And that was my favorite thing was the bend with. You got to know their beliefs. Got to know how they evaluate, how they need, how they desire, how they wound, how they interest, how they mentor, how they proud of. And if you know that, then you know what they're driven by. You know what wakes them up at night. I think that's the biggest challenge that we have is that we don't want to be too, quote unquote, intrusive. And you know what? I say bullshit. Bullshit. Like people want to talk. They're everyone's favorite yeah. subject is self. Right, Scott? Yeah, 100%. I say that all. I say that all the time. Everyone loves to talk about themselves more than anything else. Hundred uh, percent. Jeff <clears throat> Croker, you you got the next question. Let me. Uh, you should be able to take yourself off mute. But yep. Can you hear me? Okay. You. Yes, sir. We got you, Jeff. All right. So, um, hey, Mike, how you doing? Good, man. Good, good. So I'm I'm a few years older than you, um, but I remember the you know the advent uh, when. Tony first came on the scene and uh, I think I was um, driving in uh, 
LA with a uh, cassette deck and a big uh, uh, Nightingale Conan um, pack of uh, cassettes that I was sticking in and listening to, to Tony speak on that very first uh, uh, audio program that he put together. And, and so, you know, I've been introduced to NLP over the years and, uh, um, and I really, I, I recently just um, kind of reintroduced myself to it again, uh, ironically, um, within the last month because I want to get my, I really want to get my mind and my arms wrapped around it and execute against it. Cause you know, everything that I've learned, everything that I've heard, everything that I've tried to practice, I, I've never really been super successful at implementation of it. Mm -hmm. So two questions for you from a practical tactical standpoint, um, first and for foremost is, you know, negative self-talk is, is, is real, you know, and um, it happens to the best of us. And yep. what, from a, you know, a practical practice standpoint, what would you say is the most effective way to um, address that and, um, and, and really overcome it? Um, you know, I've, I've tried writing on the mirror. I've tried, um, you know, throwing up, uh, you know, uh, positive statements on a whiteboard. Uh, you know, I, I, I listen to um, very, um, a lot of self-improvement books and read a lot of books. And I try, I try, I try, and it, it's still there. It, yeah. it doesn't go away. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. And then as a follow-up to that, um, just uh, along the same lines, you know, looking for recommendations for um, those tools um, either books or um, methods or resources for all of us to learn and implement effective NLP. Yeah, so this is my, this is my favorite book right here. So I, I get paid zero to promote this book. In fact, um, I made a goal during COVID that I'm going to actually call Sue Knight because I've probably sold her more books than anybody on the planet. Uh, Sue Knight, <laughs> she's on her third edition. She's from the UK. She's uh, British. She um, here's the thickness of the book, by the way, just so you know, guys, um, yeah. it's 375 pages. But after every single chapter, I may have had this book forever. Every single yeah. chapter has um, exercises where you actually can go through like your thought process and how you think. It's one of my favorite books. Even even Tony, Tony's son, Josh got mad. He's like, Dude, you can't tell her. You can't tell the Sue Knight book. That's like, that's our secret sauce. I'm like, I don't give a shit. I'm like, dude, I want, <laughs> I want my clients to know how I think. I mean, this is my one of my favorite books, Sue Knight NLP at work. Um, and, and I would say, and I, I'm a huge fan of. If you go back to the history of NLP, if you go back to you know Google, which is you know what we do anymore, or Wikipedia, you know Richard Bandler and John Grinder. You know, the one thing you, you have to realize about uh, Richard and John, John and Richard were very, um, you know, innovative. They were at the beginning of this, uh, the 70s. This is before Tony became anything. Tony was a descendant of John and Richard. And they used to go actually to a hotel room up in Northern California. They were like, you know, Hampton Inns. Uh, I don't know if that was a thing back in the 70s, but Motel 6, if you will. And they would get 20 or 30 people in the room and they'd say, all right, who has a phobia of heights? Come on up here and sit in the chair. Who has a fear of snakes? Come up and sit in the chair. So their whole premise was, the, you know, they, they went back to uh, Carl Jung. They went back to uh, Gestalt Therapy, Milton. And they realized that if, if, if someone can do it, we can do it. That's the whole concept of modeling. Modeling is the duplication of success. So if Scott, if Scott Lees can make a million bucks a year doing this, why can't I do it? So I could go back and look at his model. His model is, when does he wake up? What does he believe? What are the questions he asks, right? That's the whole premise of NLP. So when they created it, you know, the, the, the and by the way, if you guys want to get, and I, I will throw this out there, Scott, I will give like a hundred dollar gift card to this whole group. Whoever wants to read it, okay? It's called Frogs into Princes, Frogs into Princes. It's literally a, a webinar. It was like a seminar at a hotel in 1978 that they recorded, transcribed, and put into a book. I have no idea why the publisher even wrote the book. It's 
all over the map. So when you read it, it doesn't make sense. But the whole premise, if you understand LP is, oh, I see what these guys are doing. They're taking real people, put them on stage, recording it, and trying to figure out their model. What do they say to themselves? What do they think when they see a snake? When they see heights, when they go in an elevator, what's their first language pattern in their head, right? So they're trying to break down the fundamentals of it. So the famous NLP book in our world is Frogs and Princess by John Grinder and Richard Bandler. Um, which, by the way, when you see the cover, it looks like they did an acid when they wrote it. I mean, it's super janky. <laughs> you know, it looks like they, you know, smoked you know, two bit huge joints from uh, Texas or California when they did it. But, but you know what? It's good stuff. I mean, when you look at the, the, the technology, it's, it's evolved itself. So that right now, there's a lot of master classes on this stuff, guys, if you really want to take it to that next level. But I'm, I'm kind of old school. I like to read the book, kind of go through it. Um, but I would say that's a, where I would start. You know, is is, is kind of have, have a book and a journal, and start to come up with your own patterns. Like, wh what triggers you? What's your thoughts? What's your you know what what what's your your fears? It, it goes back to the fundamental things, right? Mindset, language, patterns. So when you understand your mindset, it starts to trigger your language, which is how you talk to yourself. And your patterns are simply behavior. Behavior is how you show up, and that's a really easy to identify. If I if I followed you around, pull that tape I talked about. If I followed Scott for a week, I'd be able to say, okay, he wakes up at five. He makes the kids breakfast at seven. He goes on a Zoom at eight. Like I can see his patterns. Those are all behaviors. So if I could pull the tape on what his behaviors are, I can start to surmise or deduce why he's getting certain results or not in his life. Why he's not crushing it in business or why he's not getting time for himself. Why he's not hitting the journal and writing books for himself. Because, you know, I know Scott's a very creative guy mm -hmm. and I'm surprised he's not a best-selling author by now by his fifth book. <laughs> props, bro, props. Lazy, laziness. <laughs> not true, not true. Uh, all right, we got a question from Ryan Walker. Thanks for your question, Jeff. Ryan, are you there? I'm here. What's going on, Scott? All right, buddy. Hey, Mike, how are you? Good, bro. All right, live from uh, Chicago, so I appreciate the, the shout-out, man. Jared Payton, man, my boy. That's it. I'm right next to Walter Payton High School. Um, so, and you, you were sort of getting at the uh, the answer to this, I feel like, in, in what you were just talking through. But uh, this is my first time being um, exposed to this, this concept uh, at all. And I'm just interested to see if you have any thoughts around nuances to how you approach this, um, applying this really to yourself versus uh, and I really think that much like a lot of people probably in this room as a salesperson, um, how you apply this as potentially an individual contributor in a sales environment versus being in a managerial or a leadership position. Um, and it's a relatively nebulous question, but just wanted to get your take on that. So the way I think you have to remember the, uh, the concept, I mean, what am I, not Tony or Dan, my, my senior mentors when I was back in the day um, taught me, he's my third mentor. I called him Scott. It's not Scott, you. You're, you're my mentor in a different way, Scott, at least. Um, he told me there's a human doing and a human being. Okay. So the human is the skin bag that we live in. The human being is the part that we live out every day. Who are you being every day? If you look at the word B, B, E, human being, be, be careful. I mean, I'll, 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 if you can Google it, you can see what the word B, E means. A human being is your manifestation of what you want your character to be, right? So when you think about who are you being on a daily basis? That, I don't care if it's management, sales, leadership, say, you know, or, or, or um, uh, being a parent. I mean, it doesn't matter. You just fill in the blank. You're whatever your identity you associate with. But the, prob the problem is that we don't, we don't take responsibility, Ryan, about our being. Like we're humans, right? Like I, I always, it's one of my, and Scott knows, it's one of my biggest frustrations when I do coaching once. So, well, dude, I, I, yeah, I effed up, man. I'm a human. I'm like, yeah, I know you're human, dude, but you're a human being. Like you, you be not well. Like you be, you showed up like shit. Like you showed up <laughs> like shit. Like you got hammered, yeah. acted like an idiot. You, you were just being a dumb dumb like that. Now, what were you doing? I understand the human part, but who are you being, right? So when you go back to the being part and you get you take responsibility for that part, and I think that's the biggest challenge, right? Is that we we know intuitively that we're human, that we're going to make mistakes, you, me, and everybody, right? 
But when you're more consciously aware of who you be on a daily basis, which is what my, my third mentor, Scott, told me, is Mike, who are you being right now? Who are you being? I thought, yeah, I never thought about that. I never thought about that. Who am I being today? Who am I being? You have to remember, I'm 31 years old, not married, not kids at the time. But at, the, but at that time in my life, I needed that because I was just being a human. He goes, yeah, that's the problem. He goes, that's, he goes, that's 90% of people. 90% of people are just being human. The people that really get it, they're being, right? So when you look at what you're asking, you know, in terms of your question, it's, it's, it's proclaiming it every day, every week, writing it down, pulling out the journal on a daily, weekly basis and saying, who do I want to be this week? If I'm going to be the best dad, I mean, this is a tough question, guys. I mean, being a, a dad of two sons, you know, my dad was a great father. My dad was my best man at my wedding, by the way, just so you guys know. So my dad was like a really good figure in my life. It wasn't like we had a bad relationship. Um, I wanted to, and I remember the card I wrote my father for my wedding just 15 years ago. My wedding anniversary was um, March 31st, a couple of days ago. I, and I told him, I said, dad, if I could be half, half of the dad you were for me, for my sons, I'm good. And it, I've never seen my dad cry, like ever. Like my dad's a tough guy, right? And I remember thinking, wow, that really created emotion in him. But I realized after the fact is that I don't express that enough. So I, I'm not being sharing. I'm not being emotional. I'm not being caring. I'm not being loving towards my father or grateful for my father. So that's what I try to reverse with my kids. And I love it. The fact that, you know, right and cold or, or emotional or they get that those kind of moments in their life because I didn't have those moments in my life, you know? So when you think about sales leadership, your identity, you have to look at who you're being, but, but, but here's the thing, right? You have to proclaim this stuff. You got to pull up the pen and write this stuff down and go, who am I going to be this month as an entrepreneur? I'm going to be loving, caring, honest, authentic, whatever you come up with. And that's what most people don't do. They don't, they don't want it. I mean, like I said, making fun of guys, you know, we're, we suck at the F word feelings, but to be able to like pull up off your wall, like your mission statement, which I'm looking at, that was the hardest thing for me to write 12 years ago. I'm, a, I'm curious, I'm authentic, I'm compassionate. So when I'm reading this stuff, I'm like, oh, it's so cheesy. This is so cheesy. But then I thought, you know, it's not. It's, that's who I want to be. Right. And that's the hardest part about being a human being. To help, to that, help at all? Yeah, very much so. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate cool. it. Yeah, no problem. Eric, Eric Davidek. Hey, Mike. Um, first off, I got to tell you, I am like world class with the F word. So just, just, uh, just, just to let you know. You cry a lot. You cry a lot. Uh, yeah. Yes, he, yes, he does. <laughs> We've all, we all know he does. Yeah. Yeah. So, everybody's so, seen it. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second. So Eric, when's the last time you cried? What time is it? 5.50. 5.50 in Arizona. Hey, hey, what time is it? Best answer ever, Eric. I am so proud of you. Hey, you can argue oh with that, God. man. That's I legit. love it. That's legit. He's so raw. Oh my gosh. I love I fucking it. love that. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh. So, Michael, I'm going to piggyback. I'll, I'll try to get through this without crying, but I'm going to piggyback on Jeff's question. And um, that self-talk thing has been, uh, um, you know, it's, it's something that I've been aware of my whole life, of course, but becoming hyper aware of it and actually making taking actions on it has probably been the most impactful thing that's happened in my life and definitely the, the lesson of 2020 for me. Um, but my question is, are there any concrete techniques, um, you know, things when you, you know, when I catch myself having these conversations that go, go the wrong way, what, what can I do? Yep. So great question. Um, God, there's so that, that's, that's a lot. Um, so what I, I learned this from uh, my mentor, Tony used to talk about pattern interrupts. Pattern interrupts are things that are literally blatant and overt. So if you feel like you're, you're, you're feeling stress, you have to do the opposite of stress. So the opposite of stress is run around. And this sounds kind of goofy and kind of Tony Robbins in this, but you run around smiling, go, woo, woo, I feel great. You know, and I'm like, that's eh, not my deal, Tony. I'm not really a guy that's going to run around in the parking lot talking about, woo, woo, I feel great. That's just not my deal. 
right? I mean, we, we used to do the uh, UPW was the firewalk seminar back in the day. And we used to try to get people's uh, state of mind around their fear. So I didn't realize that 72% of people are afraid of fire, uh, suffocation, and tall buildings, like falling out of the sky. Kind of like what we experienced during 2011, God bless, you know, what we saw people doing on the television set, but I, that's a real thing. So that's a human instinctive response based off of nurture or nature or whatever. So when you think about yourself, you got to look at it and say, okay, what's the trigger and then how do I reframe it is what I call it. Reframe it, it doesn't have to be like, you know, woohoo. It has to be something you tell yourself. So what I do, this, this is a personal thing. So I try to use, uh, try, I mean, I do it. I, I don't do it hundred percent, but I use my phone. So in the morning when I wake up, I do a 10 minute snooze and I'm not a sleeper in guy. I wake up at five, it snoozes for 10 minutes. I hit the snooze button, but during the 10 minutes I go into my meditation while I'm still sleeping or waking up, coming to. And I talk to myself, today's going to be a great day. I'm going to be the best version of myself. God, give me the grand power to be the best version of myself for other people. Talk through me, da, 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 right? I do the same thing around 1230 and one o'clock in the afternoon. And I do it at night when I go to bed. And I, by the way, Scott, you and I haven't talked about this. I'm a big fan, uh, not to be promoting here, but I love the Calm app. The Calm app is awesome. Like there's a gal on the call map. It's got the British accent. She's like my, I'll pull her up. She's amazing. So I can listen to piano apps, whatever. But while I'm going to bed at night, I think about my meditation. So three times a day, I go through morning, night, or morning, afternoon, night, but just to kind of reframe my brain. And that's not something most people do, by the way. I, I did some research. Three, ti did. three times a day? You said three times a day, Mike? Morning, no, morning, afternoon, night. Wow. Yeah, but it's only for eight minutes. It's only about eight minutes tops, each one. I mean, the evening's very easy, though. The evening's tough. You know, you're falling asleep, you're laying in bed, you're waking up, but I only hit the, the snooze button for 10 minutes. The, the hardest one's the middle of the day. When I do one o'clock snooze, but it, it's on my phone, it triggers. So it tells me, hey, it's your meditation time. So if I'm in my office right in my studio, it literally tells me, shut off the lights, shut down. That's kind of what I do three times a day. That's a, it's helped a lot, man. And I got to tell you guys, during COVID, it's been tough. I mean, thank God I have, actually have an office. It's not actually at my home. So my, my two kids are not doing virtual. We're in a private Catholic school. So they've been going off to school and I'm blessed for that. But, you know, the first four months, it wasn't like that. We were all up on each other. We're ripping the Wi-Fi and getting pissed off at each other. Dad, turn off the video. I can't get the Wi-Fi. I can't get my math homework. Right. This yeah. is like, you know, third world problems back in June, July of last year. But, you know, that's for or two hours or two hours ago at my house. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw I know why we're talking, by the way, Scott, I, I could see my wife. I went down to my house for two hours. My kids are probably freaking out. But <laughs> uh, all right. We got a question from Travis. Travis Fisk. You ready? Mike, can you hear me? Yeah. How you doing? Thank you. Um, so you, you were talking about, I forget the exact context, but I think it was about church and it was someone praying saying they don't want there to be COVID anymore, right? Um, yeah, that's my son, my son. Your, your son, okay. Um, they're saying how they don't want COVID anymore. It, does it make a difference if you change the phrasing of your thought process? So instead of saying like, you know, looking for what you don't want, phrasing and saying like, well, I want there not to be COVID, you know, simply rephrasing how your, your state of mind is. Yeah. Yeah, the answer is yes. It's all it's all based off NLP. It's all mindset language pattern. So, if I said to you, um, so uh, let's see who I'll pick on, Melissa, Melissa Meyer, ready? Come off me real she's quick. A, she's a good one to pick on. All right, Melissa, you ready? I am. Yes. All right. <laughs> all right. Where are you from? I am in Madison, Wisconsin. So not too far from Chicago, but definitely not a Bears. Definitely a Packers fan. Yeah. Oh, you like you like the, you like the Badgers. I love my Badgers. I am a Badger. Yes. Okay, you ready for this? Don't hear me out. Don't think of the Badgers losing. Don't mm -hmm. think of the Badgers losing. Don't think of the Badgers losing. Oh, by the way, Russell Wilson. Oh wait, Badgers. Wait, losing. Wait, losing. 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 What's in your head right now? They crash the their brackets. Yeah. Of course. Of course. <laughs> 
because I just fed your brain, right? right. So yeah, when of you course. Tell yourself, you know, it, it's so important how you feed the brain. It's like, don't think of elephants, you know, yeah, don't think of, or if you, somebody makes you go on a diet and you're like, I can't have a donut. All of a sudden, all you want is donuts. Fuck that. Eat all the donuts. Like you can, you're in charge. You are in charge. And by, you know what? By the way, if there's anybody out there on this whole group that's trying to lose weight, here's my, here's my recommendation. I'm not a, like a lose weight guy for like a. Oh, a, Chris burn. No, Sorry. My, <laughs> you know, my favorite is the rock. The I rock. love the rock. You know what the rock tells you? The rock will tell you. Eat whatever the F you want for six days, okay? Keep track, measure it, so you have a little bit of a deficit, okay? A little bit. But on the seventh day, whatever you, it could be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever you want, eat whatever the F you want. If you look at his blog, he eats like 10,000 calories on Saturday. The guy's insane. I mean, he's a big guy, don't get me wrong. But it's the mindset, right? As long as you're tracking something, you're focusing on what you want. And that's the part about language patterns is that we tend to feed ourselves what we don't want because we're so worried about, and guys, this is classic fight or flight. Fight or flight says survive, protect, survive, protect. But when you get into, I mean, who wakes up there every morning and goes, oh my gosh, I'm so abundant. I feel so great today. Today's amazing. Like nobody over, up, nobody over 40 says that. I don't wake up that way. The first thing I think about is, oh crap, I got to, I got to. Feed the kids, get them off to school. Yeah. Rhett, and Art, Rhett and Cole are going to argue for a half hour. They're, I got to get him, get his shoes on at nine. I mean, I'm already going through the mental program in my brain, right? That's it's, it's a reality. So you can't just flip the script and just assume it's all like Pollyanna. You just have to like get it inside your mindset. To your question is, where do those negative language patterns show up? Most of the language patterns show up around the gym, workout, goal setting, money. Money is a big one. People are like, oh, I need, to, I need to get rid of debt, get rid of debt, get rid of debt. Guess what you're getting focused on? Debt. Why don't you say abundance? Abundance. I'm going to go out and make $10,000 this month. I'm going to make $10,000 this month. I'm going to make twenty grand this month. You don't focus on debt. So when you focus on debt, you give more energy to the debt. And that's the part about language pattern that's so important to, to reframe. By the way, okay. Scott, you know this. It's easier said than done. You cannot eat. It's not... You gotta practice, guys. It's it's such yeah, a yeah. such a language pattern shift in the brain. Um, yeah, you gotta you gotta get to a place where you you gotta get to a place where you catch yourself doing the wrong right. thing. That's right. Where you notice it. And you're like, oh fuck. And yep. then you and then you redo it. That Which was a, what, that was a big like milestone for me is was starting to catch myself doing the yeah, wrong. Yeah, that's thing. what uh, Scott and I call it. We call it real time. When you catch yourself in real time, you gotta catch yourself in real time. Like it could be around anything, relationships. It could be about you know, your confidence to be a good example, but you have to reframe it like quickly in your mindset. So when you feel it come on, you got to reframe it. Such an important thing. Yeah. All right. We got Johnny. Johnny, you ready? Johnny B. Johnny I hope B. So. There he is. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much. Hey, Michael. Hey, man. You know, my 20s, I was Mr. Positive. People hated me. Like I was always smiling, excited about everything. Mr. Ra Ra, life started to happen. People hurt you. You develop this real bad dark side, man. And um, I was successful using it for motivation. And I realized, you know, my mid thirties in sales, what I started to do was just always be distracted. That was my trick of staying in the moment. So I'd have an audible book on, or I'd always have some music on, something to keep me in the moment. That was my trick. And then I started, I watched Michael Jordan's Hall of Fame speech. And I realized there was a way I could actually harness this dark side to be incredibly productive. And I wanted to get some of your feedback on how to do that, what your experience has been, and what advice you have for the group on mastering that dark side. Thank That's you. Great question. I yep. love that so, question. So, so uh, Scott, don't take him off me real quick. So Johnny, let me ask you a question. What do you think about Michael Jordan's speech? You know, I want everyone to watch it because he used uh, the guy who beat him out in high school to introduce him. Uh, the guy dug really deep. He always found a way to motivate himself. The first time I watched it, I was disgusted by him. You yep. know, I, he was one of my heroes. I said, dude, that's so disappointing that you used anger to motivate you like that. 
You know, you could, you could be a better role model to people. But I think once I lived through a few things, I started to understand where he was coming from. I'm not going to cry. Yep. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you what, man, I get it now. I do. So I, so I was in uh, Tucson at my mom's house back when whatever year you could Google it or whatever year it was 12 years ago when I saw it live. And by the way, just so you guys know, I don't mind sharing this, Scott. Hopefully you don't get too mad at me here. See that on the wall? Oh. What is that? Is that a Bulls jersey? Yeah. Michael Jordan jersey from, from way back. He's one of my heroes back in the day. And I keep that on my wall in my office as a reminder to me to be humble. Um, not because I'm proud, because I, I was not proud of him when he gave that speech. I was really appalled, to be honest with you. I was, I was embarrassed. I was appalled. Um, you know, thank God there wasn't social media back when he did that, because I would have been on Twitter, like blowing him up uh, about how embarrassing it was to have uh, the greatest, the GOAT, the GOAT, greatest of all time basketball player, go on national media in front of 8 million people and personally invite every single person since junior high school that told him he couldn't do it to remind them how he did do it. Like that's not how I was raised. I was raised it be a champion, be a, but the, by the way, just so you know, Johnny, my favorite speech hall of fame basketball is Dennis Rodman by yeah. far. By far. I cried my face out watching Dennis Rodman because you know why grandmother raised him. Mom wasn't there. Dad wasn't there. Super grateful, heartfelt, like, no errors about it. Like he was just bobbling of, of authenticity, right? And you see Jordan get up there and go, hey, let's go back to uh, when I was in high school and I got cut from the varsity team. I'm like, what in the hell is going on here, right? But you know what I realized? And this is one of my rules in coaching, guys. Don't judge, be curious. Don't judge, be curious. The guy had a life of anger and he had a life of being told he couldn't do it. And he's, he's a fear-based guy. So when you're a fierce competitor, like Michael Jordan is, you don't want to lose. It's, I don't want to lose. There's a big difference between I don't want to lose and I want to win, right? You look at Kobe Bryant, Kobe Bryant wanted to win, okay? He didn't want to lose. He, he was very fierce, but his mindset was different, but, it, but it's what you said. It's the mindset of what's going to control you, what's going to manipulate your mindset around pain and pleasure. So some people are driven that way. Some people are not. So you look at pain and pleasure and you look at, you know, your own life and the fact that you're able to like articulate what you just said is so important because a lot of people can't articulate that. Some people just don't want to lose. And my and Tiger Woods, classic example, don't want to lose. You know what? I, I watched that documentary too, Scott. I don't know if you saw it. Powerful. Yeah, man. I did. His, yeah, dad, his, his, his dad was militaristic, literally get into his brain from the time he was two and a half. He had no chance. No chance between zero and five, your beliefs are formed by your parents. By the time he was five, he already had a militaristic belief from his own father who came from his own father, right? Who Tiger didn't even know that's beaten into his own brain about not losing versus I just want to win, man. That's why I like Phil Mickelson. I like Bubba Watson as golfers, like Charles Barkley. He's a, he's a neighbor here in Phoenix. Charles is just a local guy, man. He's like, Hey man, I came from the South. I, I went through racism in Auburn, but you know what? I just want to win. I just want to have fun. I like that mindset. I mean, that's more my, 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 I don't know, I'd say MO, you know, so to speak. But it, when you're, when you're talking about what you're talking about, it's, it's, it's how we feed the brain at the same time. We have to be mindful of that. Thank Good you. What's up, Johnny? Thank you. All right, Mike, we got a, I'm going to ask an anonymous question here. Go. Okay. Um, Somebody would like to know how you define self-care and how do you keep that mindset around self-care going when you are taxed, when you're busy, when you're stressed, as you, you progress in your responsibilities, right? Well, how, do you, how do you define it? And then how do you keep it a, a focus and a, and a priority as, as your responsibilities and everything around you gets noisier? So to me, it's, it's definitely evolved over the years, Scotty, but I would say um, yeah. self-care for me anymore is, is journaling, you know, having time to myself. I mean, I, I'm pretty private about my moments. I, I put my, you know, my, tell my earbuds on. Mike, tell them, 
tell them tell them about your uh your getaway oh man if you don't mind if you don't uh, mind all right yeah i don't mind i don't mind so um so journaling you know is a weekly thing i don't do it every day guys so don't think i'm some wake up guy and journal every day i don't do that um i probably journal i mean i can look back on my journal notes i would say probably probably three or four times a week i journal and it's not like a diary i don't want you guys to think it's like hey dear diary i'm fifth grade I'm depressed. Kids are making fun of me at school. It's not like that. To me, I use the journal as a capture mechanism. Um, and so four to five times a week, this is kind of like my outlet to be able to just kind of download to what I do. But to Scott's point, um, it was gifted to me from uh, actually when I was doing uh, the Robbins programs back in the day, there was a guest speaker and he talked about how every year he went away for five days. He was in San Diego and he would go away to Colorado and this is before like VRBO and you know, all the outlets we have now. He would rent a house for like four or five days by himself. And this guy's married. I'm single, no kids at the time. I'm listening to this guy. I'm like, wow, his wife and his kids like let him go away for five days by himself in Colorado just to be by himself. So I thought that was intriguing to me. And then I, after the event, I went up and I asked him, I go, hey, buddy, what's your process? Like, what's your... Tell me how it works, because I, I don't even know how to even do that. Like, if I'm going to go away by myself, I'm going to want to, like, get a massage or go on a run or watch sports on TV or drink a beer or whatever. I, it, give me a format. So he told me his format, and I followed it. So that first year, I, I started doing it. I went up to uh, Northern California. Do any, do any NorCal people up in here? NorCal? You no, know I am. <laughs> yeah, I know. Johnny, where are you at? San Francisco, but we left in the RV six months ago in our camper van. So that's why I'm in a different place every time I see gotcha. you. Okay, cool. So we went to, um, so the place I went to by myself was called Spirit Rock. And you guys can Google this. This is up in Marin County. So you, you drive across the Golden Gate Bridge. It's up there. It's like a three-day Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And all they do is it's kind of cryptic. It's kind of like cultish. They send you this email that says, by the way, when you check in, don't look at anybody in the eyes. Don't talk to anybody. Uh, mind your business and don't bitch and moan, basically. <laughs> like whatever is going to be thrown at you, just accept it. So I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so crazy. So I went and checked in and um, I got, thank goodness, I got a roommate or a, a room by myself. Because it warns you in the, uh, the terms and conditions, you might have a roommate. By the way, male or female, can you imagine like in this day and age, checking into a random place in a dorm and all of a sudden Melissa is like my roommate, I'm like in a single bed, right? I mean, Melissa, you're, you're cool. You seem cool, but you're like, <laughs> looking at me, right? You're looking at she me has, like. She has <laughs> shared stories previously on Tequila Tuesday. She I mean, is very you, cool. <laughs> I mean, you, don't, you don't want that. So um, we get this full agenda. So. I went for three full days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and a lot of, obviously a lot of journaling, a lot of writing and a lot of meditations and meditation walks and prayer. And it's not even religious guys. If you pull it up, Spirit Rock is the Spirit Rock Meditation Center. But I had never gone, I realized at that point in my life, I had never gone three full days without talking, literally talking in my whole life. I mean, you can imagine a two-year-old. I mean, from the time I was one, two years old, I'm yeah, bah, 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 just you know, screaming and yelling. But to go, you know, as a 30, whatever I was, 32 years old at the time, whatever, to go up to Spear Rock and just have that private time itself. But what I realized, guys, was the what was the journal time, was having this and the private time. And that's what I've been, that's been my solace uh, to your question, is to just still off time i mean covid's been difficult arizona's been obviously a little bit more opened up than arizona i know scott you're in texas you're more opened up like florida but um you know i've had some friends in certain parts of the states where they just can't even go into the starbucks and you know put the earbuds in and just sit for an hour and just journal by themselves i totally get it so whatever you decide to do with yourself by yourself you know you start downloading your thoughts and when you see it you know it's my, that's what i say i'm a big fan of what's written is real you know, when you write something down and you see it and you come back to it, there's such a power in, it's like, I always call it the power of the pen. You know, once it leaves my brain, comes through the pen and it hits the journal, uh, like it's out, it's out. It's in, it's in, it's in the journal. I mean, it's, it's what I feel. It's what I think. 
And I think that's what the challenge that I think a lot of us have is that we don't have that mechanism um, enough to be able to have that outlet just to be able to just get real with ourselves. I call it true up. When you true up with yourself, um, it's no bullshit, no bullshit. Like you got to be honest with yourself. Are you, are you the, are you the right version of yourself that you want to be? Are you the right weight that you want to, you step on the scale. If the scale says you're 10 pounds overweight, you're 10 pounds overweight, but we don't have that emotionally, right? To all say, Mike, you're not congruent with yourself. There's no scale emotionally. that says, dude, you're 12 pounds, not overweight with yourself emotionally. Right. So that's what, that's what the journal does. I think for me. All right. We got David Libby you there, David. I'm there. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, Scott. Appreciate this. Yeah, this is really, really awesome. And uh, Hey, thanks Michael for showing up and for uh, sharing That's this is just, I've been taking a lot of notes. <laughs> yeah, Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So um, my question is uh, a common question like everybody else, but to, to, just a quick start to, uh, to think about what motivates people. I often think fear does. You know, I've been helping manage a bunch of BDRs for the last couple of years. And when I hear them, they talk about what's not happening. They talk about how they haven't met their goals or they talk about how this hasn't happened. That, I mean, it's exhausting. And I, I, you know, I, I'm in there and I'm positive and I try and stay motivated, but I'm wondering you know, if we're not motivated by fear, what are we motivated by? What can we tell ourselves, even to the younger people, you know, I'm 50, even to the younger people in this, in this Zoom, it's like, yep. what, what, can, what can we say to these folks and, and or say to ourselves to keep us motivated? I mean, I mean, I'm sure it's not gonna happen every moment, every day, but there's gotta be some sort of narrative, right? Yep. And if it's the MLT, NLP at workbook, I already bought it. But if you wanna just kind of go in on that and give us some feedback, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, so uh, my wife's uh, brother, He's 25. He just turned 25 last year. Graduated ASU. Go Scott. To be represented. Yep. That's right. Um, There's a couple other Sun Devils on this. Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right. We gotta we gotta yeah. represent. Uh, so he was over for Easter, and um, you know he's going through a life transition with his job and this and the other. And he and he grew up, if you will, you know, I'm putting my finger quotes, you know, underneath me because I've known him since he was a baby. Um, and he he knows how I think, and he'll, he'll he's a very sharp guy. He's He's smarter than me in every way, shape, and form. And I mean that like SAT smart, LSAT smart. Like he's a, he's a sharp guy. So he, he, was, he kind of, you know, downloading to me like a buddy, you know what's going on, right? And he's like, I know, I know what you're going to tell me. It's purpose and why. Purpose and why. He goes, I knew you were going to say that. I'm like, why are you asking me? You already know how I teach and think. He goes, y your pain is strong. You need to pay rent. You got to pay the bills. You got a new girlfriend. She's, you know, she's a very nice gal, but you know, she, you got dates. You gotta go, you gotta go pay for the dates. It's a real thing, right? He's not had a girlfriend in the last three years. So that's a real, that's a reality of his life. So when we started talking about it more authentically at that level, um, we started getting to the purpose and why question, um, which by the way, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek. If you go back and pull up his, you know, Ted talks on um, Google or read his book. Um, and by the way, again, I don't get paid to tell you that Simon is a, he's a good dude. Simon's Simon came up in our world. Uh, he was a geek back in the day. He'll, 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 he'll hate me for saying this, but he was kind of like a nobody <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> so we didn't give him the time of the day back in the Tony Robbins days. We always had like uh, Larry King and like Wayne Gretzky and uh, Muhammad Ali, all the motivational people. And this young kid, Simon Sennock was like, dude, you guys got to get somebody up here that talks about purpose and why I'm a professor. I know this stuff. I'm like, yeah, but you're a geek. You're kind of a tool. I mean, let's be real, man. You're kind of a tool, but he's not so much of a tool anymore. The guy's worth a lot of money. He's written a great books. He's a good dude. But when you read his stuff, it goes back to what I'm telling you either have pain motivation, which is the fear motive, you know, the fear factor, or you go back to purpose and why when you're emotionally associated to purpose and why, like on a daily basis. And that's why I ask my CEOs all the time, well, what keeps you up at night? What keeps you up at night? It's my favorite question. And I had a CEO tell me last week, he said, you know what keeps you up at night? Payroll. I go, Bob, how does payroll keep you up at night? He goes, buddy, that's my reality. Like I have 42 employees. These are lives. These are humans. These are people that are on my job, my team. And if, if I can't make payroll, that's on me. And, I, and I, being a solo entrepreneur and my wife, I don't think about that. I think about, you know what, I'll just go out there and hustle tomorrow. I'll get another deal, get another gig, get a couple coaching clients or whatever. I don't think about payroll. 
that doesn't motivate me yeah. in my brain, right? So when you think about purpose and why, and you have to go back to what's the driving force between what keeps you up at night and what's going to be that driving force for you personally. And what I, what I would recommend to the question is come up with something that's, that's tangible. Uh, and I mean this, by the way, tangible. So if you said to yourself, you know what, waking up at five in the morning, going to the gym and making sure I get eight hours sleep is mandatory for my entrepreneurship. If I don't do that, that means I'm losing money, pain, but also means I'm making a lot of money abundance, right? So you have to create that frame of what's the abundance and the payoff of what's going to be the pleasure to your action. And that's where I think a lot of us miss is the pleasure to the action because we get so, we get so um, afraid. We get so pain motivated, like, oh my, if I don't do this, this is what's going to happen. Well, what's the payoff? That's why getting back to purpose and why it's so important. That's why I'm a big fan of what you know Simon Sinek puts out there. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great question. All right. We got Bree. Oh, you beat me to it, Bree. She's ready to go. <laughs> okay. This has all been amazing. And um, you know, I I've uh listened to a lot of Tony's stuff over the years and and I guess my main question is around loss of identity because, and how you are getting it back um, and maybe redefining it. Because for myself, you know, I, you know, just giving you some bullet points um, without going too deep, you know, I now have a grown child who has flown the nest. So even though I'm always going to be a mother, it looks different now. You know, I don't have that hands on parenting. Um, my business, I had a huge, I had a business for a decade and with things outside of my control that I didn't, you know, I had no control of the federal trade commission suing the company I built a business through. So when I lost over a hundred thousand dollars a year in income, I had a drastic life change. So like my plan, as much as I love you all was not to be here. My plan was to be surfing in Costa Rica or learning, you know, Italian in, in Italy. And so now, although I have a great job that I love, I have to find this new identity. And I'm trying to establish this now, who am I? But yet I have this, this unsettled, there's this deep part of me that's unsettled and this, this question going, there has to be something more, you know, because I know what I don't want. I, you hold know. On, hold, wait, hold on. What, what do you not want? What, what, what don't you want? Well, I've been there, done that, having a child. So even though, you know, I'm not going to start a family over again at 41. So, you know, as I am reestablishing myself in a career now, I've, you know, I may do the entrepreneurship thing again in a different way, but, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what does, what does my identity look like now? Sure. So we, you said you have a job, J-O-B, yeah. is that, is that true? Like, is it just something you, you're just doing because it makes money for you? Or is it like something you like to do? I enjoy it. It's a, it's a new job for me, but I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. So Scott and I, I'm not sure if Scott shared this with you guys, but um, we have an acronym J-O-B means just over broke. Yep, I've heard that. I was yeah. in multi-level multi marketing for years. I used that for years. Yeah. So, but you said job. You said it. That's a language pattern. That's NLP. Yeah. That's a language pattern that you said. So when you said it out loud to all of us, you said that to yourself ten thousand times. Yes. So is it really a job, or is it something you like to do? It is something that. I like to do, but if I'm going to be honest, I don't see myself working for anybody for the rest of my life. Okay. So, so what do you want? I don't know. That's the problem. <laughs> By the way, if, if, Scott, you're recording this, right? I sure am. Yeah. So go back and replay this video. Watch how she looked left and look how she looked right with my two different questions. That's classic NLP. She's trying to recall things in her mind and she's trying to create things in her other part of her mind. And that's not a judgment for you, by the way. I appreciate you being authentic. That's just the way the brain works. So what you have to do is get clear in your head about looking straight in the face, looking right at that lens and telling me, Mike, here's what's up. But you're looking left and you're looking right. That's a metaphor we use in NLP. When you look left and right in your head, that means you don't really know. And that's fine. That's, that's most people. Yeah. Most people are, are looking left and right, trying to figure out, do I recall, do I remember, or do I make up? So when you create that look forward and say, this is what I've fucking want 
This is my passion, right? This isn't, forget my language, but you get my point, right? When yeah, you get yeah. that passionate about it and you know exactly where you are in your mindset, that's where things start to shift. So I think the biggest thing is you journaling. I mean, go back to the journal point of write down a full page. If I ask you, where do you see yourself in 12 months? So if I call you and let's go, I'll, I'll, I'll even give you another quarter. Fourth of July of 2022. I'm going to call you on the phone, Bree, and go, so where you at? Where you at? You've already stated for where you're at now and you're going to go and work towards it in the next 13 months. You already know entrepreneur. You already know entrepreneur. It's not a job. You know that. It's, yeah. it's you getting. It's so it. funny to. It's so uh, funny to me to, to, to. It's so funny, Mike, to to hear her talk to me. I'm like, what do you mean you don't want? I've literally just heard you say what you want. A couple 100%, of times. Hundred <laughs> percent. Every there's, Melissa's nodding her head like. That's why. Hear it. And Scott, that's why you have to show play back the recording and send it to her. Yeah. And show her her eyeballs when I ask her the yeah. questions. You already know the minute, answer. Minute, minute, minute 95. Yeah. Boom, boom. <laughs> I love it. And by the way, Bree and anybody else out there, if you guys want to reach out to me at the end, uh, I, I really mean this. It's not a pitch. You guys call me, text me, email me, whatever. I'll give myself one at the end. Um, I, Scott's a very important person in my life. You know, that's just with coaching and the person he's been is, is authenticity, but I, I, I know his group is very important. That's why I was, I, and, and I've not been, I don't get nervous for stuff like this ever. I don't, but there was like a part of me an hour ago and he's like, dude, chill, man. We're good. We're yeah. good. I'm like, no, man, I want to make sure I'm game on. I want to make sure I got the link right. Cause I want to honor. Well, part, of it, part of that is my fault because, and these people know that like, I just wing so many things. I'm just like, yeah, it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I forget people need some structure yeah. and organization sometimes. But, That's just yeah. how I am with, with, with yeah. this kind of thing. I, you know, I took it that seriously, but you know, his, his testimony no, I, was, uh, what'd you say, bro? You said, uh, I, I said, all, uh, all, all good. No stress. That's what I wrote. Oh yeah, no, no he stress. said he said all good. All <laughs> no stress. I'm like, that's not how yeah. I think, yeah. man. That's not how I think. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's funny to hear you say, it's funny to hear you say right now, Mike, like, hey, all of you can email me, text me, whatever. Because here's what I'm, here's what I'm recognizing right now. I learned the accessibility from you. I don't, I don't know that I ever really like made that connection, honestly, truly, swear to God, Catholic version yeah. for you. I don't know if I ever really made the connection until tonight where I'm like, oh shit that's where I learned this because I'm like, text me, email me, message me. You know how many fucking DMs on LinkedIn I replied to today? Totally. Two, 234. I believe it. From yesterday. I believe it. I counted 234 people who shared stories of trauma and mistreatment through their sales career. I replied to every single one of them. And I'm listening to you right now with this group of people that you don't know at all. And you're like, text me you know, message me, whatever. I'm like, yeah, Mike was my model for accessibility and openness. So I just wanted to thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, absolutely. Um, no, we gotta, one thing, we gotta, that's one thing real quick. I want to, I want to tell, I'm going to, I want to explain that real quick. Cause I know Tony Robbins is not exactly a super accessible guy. He's you know, a pretty big guy. Uh, so the guy that hired me is named Dan Lear. Scott, you know that Dan Lear yeah, is the Dan, mentor Dan. and yeah, Dan's yeah. in Vegas. He was the, he was Tony's right hand guy. I just saw him last week. He's doing great. He had a very rare blood disease, amyloidosis. So he's been struggling for the last three years. And, mm -hmm. you know, Dan is the, the struggle I had working for Tony is Tony's six foot seven, Dan's six, eight, uh, Chuck was six, five, all the guys were six, four and above. And I'm, I'm only six foot, right? Barely. And I'm like the short guy in the group. And I'm like, guys, can I like step on a stool or something? You guys make me look like such a chump. But I remember during that whole time frame hanging out with these guys on the road when I was living in LA, Chicago, New York, the way that they thought was so, so abundant. And I, and I always thought, you know, I hope Tony, you know, just remains abundant. And he very much is like, if I text him right now, he texts me back, but I, I don't bother him. You know, the guy's worth $500 million a year, owns an island of Fiji. He's doing great. But Dan Lear taught me, his right hand guy who I just saw last week, he's like, dude, you're not that important ever. You are not that important ever. And I learned that in 98. So I said, you know what? I'm going to keep this damn 619 cell phone. I came from San Diego. 
and I'm never changing it. I'm, everyone's going to know yeah. it's going to be on my website. It's going to be on my LinkedIn. So if you want to call me, text me, I'm always going to be the guy that's going to respond to you. I'm not going to have some person doing my DMs or my social because I, I might. I mean, I'm, I'm very real about my stuff. So any one of you, I challenge you, text me. I'll give you my number at the end. Text me, call me. I mean that. You know, Scott, you've been a very important part of my life, but I mean, what you're doing with the, with the crew here. It's so important because this is what I call one percenter thinking, guys. One percenter thinking is taking the time to do something that's different. And by the way, I'm looking at all the squares. No one's dropped off. Like, I don't know what your stickiness rate is, bro, but this is crazy. Like, everyone's still here. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's like 930 on the East Coast where some of the people it. are. So, yeah. So, you know. Thank you so right, much. We, we, got a, we got a good question from Melissa Meyer, who's been picked on a little bit by us. So it's right. time for her to punch punch back. I grew oh. up between two brothers. I can take it. Um, <laughs> really, I really can. <laughs> you have no idea. Um, so we've got a lot of talk. When I'm not crushing quota, I teach yoga. And I've, this year during COVID, I've been diving a lot into like yamas and yamas and the yoga philosophy and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, which, which just flows really nicely into the, the NLP stuff and meditation yep. and all of that. Love and that. one thing that I found, um, and I have a close... I have a family member who does this. It drives me nuts is he'll say something bad is happening. Like my dad's got Alzheimer's, like bad things happen, right? Bad things happen all the time to all of us. Right. And he'll tell my mom, just be happy. Just be happy. Like just yeah. decide you're going to have a happy day. And what my mom really needs is like to process those feelings and just unload and like vent on somebody. And that's okay. Like it's okay to do that. So can you like just briefly address um, I call it toxic positivity. Some yep. people call it there's false harmony is a different thing. Um, yoga, we call it spiritual bypassing. Yep. Or like I can sit in a pose and act like I'm super chill, but it can be an absolute disaster, you know, oh, inside. So I'll so, go back on mute now. Oh man, I can't believe I'm, I'm telling this story right now. Um, <laughs> by the way, I've seen the documentary, so I'm very aware of what this gentleman I'm about to tell you about is going through legally. Was uh, I was a Bikram yoga guy back in San Diego. Okay, back in 2001, 2002. So I'm not saying I was, I was a fan of him or who he was or his, you know, his guruism. I, I'm a very big fan of his 26 postures and 90 minutes of my meditation in my head, you know, going through that 108 degree temperature back in San Diego. And one of the gals who was the um, very similar to you, uh, Melissa, was like his mentees. That, by the way, was not in the documentary. She wasn't involved in the whole controversy or whatever. I'm still friends with her. She always said that, you know, he, he had his dark side, you know, Bigram did. And, but, the, the, but he was very passionate about the postures and what it meant to him. And I remember this is when my, um, oh man, I can't believe I'm telling this. Scott, dude, you're killing me right now. You're killing me. Um, hey, I know. We get real. We get real. I'm getting real. I'm getting real. Um, so my aunt, uh, she died of breast cancer when she was 42. So I was in my early thirties at the time and I was very close with her. And I remember being in a, a certain posture, it was posture 14. Um, and I was, I was a young guy, you know, pretty nimble guy. And I remember the young gal who was the, the mentee of Bikram came over to me and she got in my face in the studio at like the 70 minute mark. She goes, your pain, your suffering, your posture is a metaphor for your life. Think about what you, what's in your head right now. That's what's going on in your life. And I'm like, oh my God, this is deep, man. I'm going to be trying to like do my postures, right? And I remember walking out of there. I was so hot, you know, it's like 108 degrees. And I never forgot that because it, 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 it tied emotionally to me that that's just a metaphor. I mean, it's just a yoga class, just a yoga class, right? But you're going through that moment and you have this teacher that's feeling your pain in some way. And that's, that's life. Like when you can channel what you do you know, for a living or you channel that emotion and you make it mean, it goes back to what you and I, what, Scott and you and I talked about meanings. What does it mean to you to go through pain, struggle or whatever, and you can channel in a different way. So she would always remind me after she saw the, the literal pain on my face going through this posture, she would say, oh God, I can't remember this quote, channel the pain channel the pain, channel the pain. So her way of saying like, take the negativity and pain that's going through your knee and your hip into something that's positive to me was, which was gratitude in my aunt who was in my mind, heaven, right? She had already moved on to a different life. So 
every time I would go into that posture, and if I if my office was a little bit more cleaned out right now, I'd show you the posture. Um, and I hate that posture to this day, but it still reminds me of my aunt because it reminds me of channeling the pain of what that posture is into something that was positive. So here, so here's my answer. I always ask myself when I'm in that situation, what's great about this? What's great about it? My nine-year-old son, he's he tends to be more on the negative side when he, he, he sees something or hears something. Um, first question I ask him, I say, hey, Coleman, let me ask you a question. What's great about it? He's like, what's great about it? What do you mean, dad? What's great about it? I mean, dad, we we just lost, we lost our bet and we were in some stupid pool at the NCAA tournament last night. So we lost, you know, 400 bucks and we only took third place and won hundred bucks, whatever. We're watching March Madness. Who cares? It's all fun. Right? So he's all mad. And I said, buddy, what's great about it? And his brain is literally tied to the fact that we didn't win. I go, buddy, daddy took third. We're good. We got hundred bucks. It's all good. I'll put it in your bank account tomorrow. But that's, that's most people. That's most kids. That's most human beings. So when you can take that pain or that negative thing that you do, and it, I'm only telling you that story, Melissa, because, you, you know, being in yoga, you, you appreciate that. You know, when you're in that posture and it sucks and you're like, oh my goodness, what is going on here? But you can channel that in such a positive way. But the question you have to ask yourself is what's great about it? Yeah, I can, I mean, to be clear, not that I'm, that you know, a genius guru, but, um, you know, all of life is suffering, desire is the seed of all suffering and joy is our birthright. Like I believe those things. Yeah. And, and the focus on the lessons, not the suffering, you know, ask yourself when something hard is happening, what, what do I need to learn? Like, what is this teaching me, right? Yep. And, and the patterns repeat until you learn the lesson. You're like, God damn it, I'm right. Like, how did this happen again? It's like, cause I haven't learned yet. Yeah. It's more about like, is there any tricks like Jedi mind tricks when you run into somebody who just refuses to acknowledge that there's pain and wants to like, just like sunshine, you know, very Pollyanna, like fake false positivity. Um, well, I'll you know, that's, I'll that's my brother. And I, and there might not be an answer. I mean, my, my well, answer that, is I say, yeah, I'll look at the time I got to go. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's good. I was going to, I can't turn my computer the way I want it to, but um, my, my corporation's name is uh, one with a question mark. And the one question is how bad do you want it? And I, I basically was failing in law school when I was 23 years old in San Diego, uh, my first year of law school. And I remember writing on four, uh, five by seven cards, how bad do you want it? Do you want to get through the first year of law school or are you going to drop out and be a failure? So I, I told myself, if I get through the first year of law school and I graduate, at some point I'm going to name my company that I'm going to create one day called One Question. So that's, it's on my checks, it's on my payroll, it's on everything I do, it's in my office, one with a question mark. So, the, but the one question is, you know, whatever you want it to be. My one question is, how bad do you want it? But I also like to teach my kids, like, you know, what's great about it? You know, that's the one question. But if you take that one trigger for you, it's a trigger, right? What's the trigger that causes that stress or pressure and say, okay, I got to reframe this whole thing. And that's classic NLP guys, by the way, NLP is all about reframe. Frame is what you put around it. Frame is pre-frame is before, pre is before, frame is what you put around it. So if you put a frame around that negative situation or issue, you have to look at that and say, what's the frame I'm going to put around this? Because yeah, I choose to. And that's the hardest part, Melissa, is that most people don't, they're not aware of that power that they well, have to be able to reframe that. This toxic, positive person who's my brother, so I really can't just completely walk away from him. I mean, but I, what I tell, that's the best he can do. He's doing the best that he can. Like we're all doing the best we can in a given moment with what we're working with. And you know what? And you it's know not what? personal. It's not about me. It's not about, it's just, and that's you know, the best he can do. And Melissa, my favorite thing is with people that are like clients or friends or family is the power of the written word, writing into a, a journal or a, a page or a letter and sending it to your brother. What's your brother's name? Greg, Gregory. So you, you say, hey, Greg comma and you write a full page of what's great about greg right and you send it to him and you tell him at the very end this is the hardest part this is where i get I kind of choked up <laughs> i love you no matter what comma no matter what and that's a hard part like greg's he's off kilter maybe he's going through things you know but when you say comma no matter what that's such a powerful thing and that's that's one thing i try to teach my kids when i was young is that they're, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to go through behavior changes, you know, one years old, two years old, they're going to be kids. But if I can look at my son in the face and go, buddy, I love you. No matter what, no matter what, no matter what, it doesn't matter if it's pandemic. I mean, my mom, my mom is, I mean, thank God this is a private group, Scott. 
my mom went off the Richter the last year because COVID. I'm like, mom, you're vaccinated. You're fine. What is wrong with you? Oh, I don't know. I'm like, mom, I love you no matter what. No matter what. If you want to see the kids, it's, not, it's your choice. Conscious choice. You pick. Yeah, that's that unconditional love, which so many of us did not get. And that's where that you're, walk, you're walking around with a wound forever. Yeah. But you got to heal yourself. But thank you. Appreciate the answer. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. All right, everybody. <clears throat> Mike, this has been amazing. Really appreciate you spending time with us. Appreciate everybody being here and taking time out of their uh, their evening to um, you know, hang out, learn, interact, commune. I've dropped your uh, LinkedIn profile, your email address, your website, cell your, phone. Book URL, your book URL. I did not drop your cell phone, Mike. I'm gonna let you do that yourself. Nope, 100%. I know you're cool with, but I just wanna make sure you do that and not me. So uh, where do I put that? Should I, should I send it to the group after the fact you, or? You, 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 you say it out loud. I'll type All right, it. no, no, yeah, you guys, all right, all right, write this down, 619. 619-794-1122, 619-794-1122. I, I, I'm still holding on to that bastion of hope that San, San Diego is going to come back from where it was 25 years ago. <laughs> By hey, the way, not, that means the surf, that means everything, bro. Yo, I was surfing so long back in the day, man. That's my spot, man. man. Yeah. Oh, I have, I have not surfed since last February. You have, is that right? You have no idea. Yes. Bro. You know, it's so painful you have no idea oh, I bet. it's changed it's changing in november as i i like i just booked this surf and sales event said fuck it like i need something to look forward to or i'm literally gonna lose my mind i love it so yeah you gotta all right i'll lay out, let me get it one more time so one more time 619-794-1122 619-794-1122 um, by the way if you go to my website michaelinstrom.com if you go on the uh, comments or whatever, you send a direct message, it comes directly to me. I have my, my uh, Lana, who does my emails, she forwards that stuff to me directly 100% when I do stuff like this. So, you know, I just want to say thank you so much for, you know, having me and, I, you know, team, it's, it's been a rough year for everybody. And the one thing I've been challenging everybody I've been working with, you know, corporate or even private like this or clubhouse is, I, and I mean this from my heart, I want you to write down at least five people five people in your life, usually friends or family that you've not connected with in a long time and just called for no good reason. I knew because you were going to say that. Yeah. because You, <laughs> love them. I knew it. you know, I got to, man. I mean, dude, this saves I know, lives. I know, I know, I know, I know. It saves yeah, lives. I, I, I had no idea. I, I reached out to two guys who were in my wedding 15 years ago last week. These guys are all making millions and doing great seemingly quote unquote. And both picked up on the first ring and both said, why are you calling me? And I said, the reason why I'm calling you is because I, I love you. And I just want to make sure you're good. Are you good? And both of them said, no, I'm not, not good. Both depressed, both on medication, one suicidal. I mean, horrible, horrible. The stuff I was hearing, I'm like, buddy, why didn't you call me? He's like, dude, I can't call you. are like motivational Mike. I can't call you. You, everything's all good. I'm like, no, it's not all good, man. We're humans. We got to reach out to each other, man. It's a, we're, we're human beings. Human is the skin bag we live in. The being is how we show up every day. So I want to challenge everybody to reach out to a few people in your lives and just reach out. And, and by the way, text me, call me and let me know, hey, thanks for that. You know, I called my cousin or my friends or whatever. People are struggling out there and we need to reach out to the people we love. You guys are influencers. You guys wouldn't be on this by the way, in this community, if you weren't influencers in your own way, take that take that responsibility very seriously and reach out to people that you love. Thanks so much, Mike. Right, love bro. you, man. Appreciate it. Peace, guys. Bye, everybody.